what does it all mean? And like, what impact does it have? So Solna, I don't know if you just want to take us quickly through Poppy and its enactment tomorrow. Basically, the long and short of Poppy is it's about protection of personal information. So you're not allowed to share the personal information left, right, and center without the consent of the person whose information you are sharing. If you are, um, what's the word that they're using, Bruno? Um, if you're processing, processing is the word I'm looking for. If you're processing in personal information, you need consent. So um, processing personal information in the context of property is, is very much constantly there because you have lease agreements. A lease agreement contains personal information. Mandate agreement contains personal information. Um, if you interact with your attorney, you share personal information and they uh, process that personal information into court cool documents and court cool processes. So, so the long and the short of copy is you are not allowed to collect, process, or distribute. Ne? Look at me now, and I'm saying I don't know anything about poppy. I'm actually proud. <laughs> Moi poppy. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> can we make an Afrikaans jokes for the evening? Um, so you're not allowed to do any of that. Um, without consent from the person whose personal information you're working with. Bruno, please tell me you've got something to add there because that's absolutely everything. I have for us on Poppy. <laughs> nice. Um, uh, look, uh, there's actually a couple of articles out there if you guys are, are looking for it. So what uh, to Silna's point, TPN has done quite a few things. Um, I actually have something small out today also on Poppy uh, that um, I'm happy to post. I'm happy to post um, under Property Law Alliance. Um, look, the thing is, Poppy is quite an intensive subject. So I mean, when, when we're going into detail, uh, if we land up having to go into detail, it's going to it's going to take way too long. Um, so as long as people understand that, unfortunately, there is going to be a level of compliance uh, and a compliance officer, someone that is responsible to make sure that you as a business are compliant. So you guys need to be careful with that. You need to make sure that the right people are appointed and that you've got the right processes and protocols in place, uh, which is where the you know the whole concept of a manual comes in. And it's not actually particularly difficult. Like a lot of us are actually dealing with the information the right way, um, especially nowadays with the way the software is actually functioning because a lot of the software is built in security protocols already. And because a lot of our security protocols are based on overseas uh, rights and protection of information, it's actually already kind of compliant with the stuff that we need to be done in South Africa. So from a security perspective, have you taken the right precautions to make sure that no one can access this information? Well, you have. Because to a certain degree, if you've entrusted the likes of um, a Google Drive with, uh, or, you know, what uh, Google Drive, OneDrive, any of these document storage um, um, uh, platforms, you, uh, you know what, it is actually having done enough. But what you need to remember is it's, it's one thing to be able to say, cool, well, I'm saving onto the cloud. It's secure enough. It's all good. But you've got a network at your office that anyone can kind of walk in. And it just happens to be connected to your Wi-Fi, for example. So you give your Wi-Fi password and with a few little clicks, the guys can actually get onto your server without much difficulty. So, you know, things like that is what this is trying to push you to think about and go when employees leave, what, uh, what process do you have? And I mean, this is stuff we should all have been doing up until now. It's intuitive. Employee leaves and walks out the door, uh, but they go with your passwords. They go sometimes with links. Some, some leave with their own laptop. You, you guys need to do a complete cleanup. And I mean, that's where the corporates had it right for ages, where, I mean, I remember when, when my wife left uh, one of her corporate jobs. I mean, they, they, they actually destroy laptops because on laptops, you can actually, um, you can get data from hard drives. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there used to be a time we used to sell it and people used to be able to take it over. But because 
uh, extraction of data is actually relatively simple, even if you've deleted it. And there's people out there that would go out and actually try and extract it. They completely destroy this sort of thing. So it's just thinking along smarter lines, like practical solutions. Who has access? Have you blocked access? Do you change your passwords often enough? But short of that, you don't need to go build infrastructure and systems and put software in place. All of it already exists. They're at your fingertips. Uh, you just need to make sure the people that access it have the right consent. And then obviously your customers. So that's the other flip side of this is the, the annoying side for me is now having to contact everyone that I know to say, hi, you've known me for like 15 years now, but I need your consent because you know those emails I send you and you like so happy about and you smile and tell me, oh, I loved it. But now I need your consent 15 years later. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, to send it. But so things like that are a bit more annoying. But mm -hmm. if there are existing clients, if I'm not mistaken, it's opt out, still opt mm -hmm. out. It's only if they're not your clients, do you need to now ask them to opt in? Um, mm -hmm. so, so guys, it's just things like that that you need to consider. And then there were body corporate, just out of interest. I just want to see, it was also in the article. Uh, it's not, yeah, so... Uh, it, just a heads up, for, since this is Property Law Alliance, just a heads up with body corporates, uh, registers, people driving in, um, things like that, security registers for complexes. Uh, you also need to be careful because there's mm. a whole level of, you know, what information can you ask for? Why do you need it? Can you justify the need? And how long are you going to keep it for? Uh, you should probably be chucking it away after a period of time. Yeah, and that's it for me. I love copy because it completely gets rid of, you know, sometimes you like call into a takeaway, like you call them 10 years ago and you still get SMSs from that takeaway till today. And <laughs> we're having a Wednesday special. Like those pizza guys Wednesday that special. were bothering you. Those pizza guys yeah. that were bothering you two weeks ago. Exactly. Chris, you have such pizza issues. I'm starting to, to be deeply concerned about your diet. <laughs> <laughs> so so just, to, just to enlighten everybody, I frequently receive SMSs from takeaway joints trying to get me to buy more takeaways. I think they know I have a weakness for takeaway. But nevertheless, <laughs> to move on, we, we discussed now in, in the previous, in the live, that we had two questions from two of our viewers. And one of the viewers is Angelique Stain. And Angelique Stain uh, needs some advice on a particular matter. So I'm just going to read it the way Angie, Angie, can I call you Angie? Angie, the way you wrote it. And this is it here. Um, I'm, a bite, I'm about to sign uh, the last of a set of documents for a sectional title flat, but the spider is back. Uh, but I'm a little <laughs> confused. It's right here. But I'm a little confused. I have two sets of lawyers' fees to pay, and they basically mirror each other in terms of costs. Both have the exact same pricing for deeds office and so on. She wants to know, is this correct? Um, she says, as a first time buyer, this is quite a shock that two law firms under the same law are charging for the same thing. Please, can we provide Angelique with some advice? I'm gonna put my camera off because I've got a spider to get rid of. Over to and, you guys. And, and, and you speak in case you start screaming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually wanted to keep his camera on. <laughs> Bruno, I, I don't know if you want to. He didn't tell us who to answer. So I'll, uh, I'm so used to him, him throwing it to me, but just because it sounds like uh, the viewer and I share his surname, I think, uh, 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 I, no. I, I think I'll grab this one while Chris sure. is killing a spider. Um, by killing, I mean getting rid of. Spider, uh, yes, just, yes. just he will never. <laughs> we don't never. kill on this show. No, no. no. Um, so, uh, uh, I think the important thing to know is um, we all do charge very similar fees. Um, the law society, well, legal practice council, give us directives on conveyancing fees. So there is a, a standard tariff that we are following. We are not obliged to stick to that tariff. We are allowed to drop below it. Are we allowed to go higher? I, I think it would be silly too, but I, I don't think we mm. are limited. Um, mm. We can theoretically charge more, but that'd be mm. silly. Um, mm. But we're definitely allowed to charge less or differently. Um, you okay there, Chris? 
<laughs> just relocated him temporarily. <laughs> <laughs> not um, to, so, to the toilet <laughs> so no, you no, are no. Al allowed to charge differently um but we tend to all charge very similar fees for for conveyancing the reason why you got um invoices from two firms would be the one firm would be the bond registration firm and the other one would be the transferring firm so you need to transfer the property from the seller into your name as the purchaser. And then at the same time, if you if you obtained a bond from a bank, that bond has to be registered because remember it's a mortgage bond that has to be registered against that title deed. And the fees are very similar. Your, your bond cost and your transfer cost um, uh, tend to be quite similar. So that's the reason, um, that's the reason for that. Keep in mind, um, the transferring attorneys, you're not allowed to choose them. The bank instructs them, and they only instruct attorneys on their panels. So, unfortunately, there's not a lot of room for negotiation on price with them. You can always ask, and you can always say, um, I'm a first-time buyer. Please help me out. Um, I can't afford this fees. It came as a hectic surprise, um, the bond cost and the transfer cost. You can ask for a discount. Um, Transferring attorneys, however, you, um, as much as it is uh, the seller that appoints the transferring attorney, um, as the purchaser, you are allowed to um, use your own attorney and ask for their fees. If the seller is adamant to use their attorneys, you can tell them, but this is the financial implication I'm going to have and see if you guys can meet each other halfway. Um, but it, it sounds about right, and you will see um, always uh, transferring fees uh, and bond fees are actually always very quite quite similar. It's it's quite boring billing. Mm. Boring Thanks, billing. Sola. That was the word I just used. <laughs> uh, thank you, Salda. So now we're just <laughs> going to move over to another question and was asked uh, by Hans Liebenberg. Hans says, "Hi, uh, I have been the victim of a criminal who leased my house uh, and paid." Uh, let me just wait. Sorry, there's a criminal that he says leased his house and, and only paid rent for three months. I'm assuming that's why he calls him a criminal because this person has been residing on the property now oh. for Hans is uh, close on to 14 months. It's been a battle for about 14 months. Oh, wow. He oh. says that he, he has he's, he's, he's finally got um, a court date, uh, which I think is in July. And uh, but, but but that's not his question. Uh, the question is, he says that he's a bit afraid that this particular tenant who signed the, the lease agreement is going to disappear. Uh, it doesn't appear to me that he, the tenant, the person who signed, lives on the property, but his wife and daughter or his family rather do reside on the property. H Hans wants to know, um, can he sue the person who signed the tenant's wife? Because she is also mentioned, it goes a bit deeper. There was um, a prediction order or rather a charge of harassment that was laid by the tenant against Hans for coming to the property, which he, he obviously indicates here is completely false. Um, but nevertheless, he says that there's a risk that this particular tenant is just going to up and leave and become untraceable. And he wants to know, can he sue the wife who is actually an occupant on the property and who has been mentioned in the protection order as well? Uh, oh, sorry, the harassment charge, which says that she's a resident on the property. Um, I'm not sure. If, let me just ask Bruno uh, this one here. Sure. Um, so, so to answer the question as short as possible, um, if if there was a, um, a tenant on the property, he paid, uh, he paid three months. Now, I'm assuming how this actually went down. He paid for three months, then he stopped paying. Um, I'm going to... Uh, just set aside like the criminal notion for now. So even though the viewer did s speak of it, the problem is we do need to distinguish between actual criminality and which we understand, but to take uh, the, from an emotional perspective, it's 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 criminal. But the reality is whether the SAPS would ever treat this as criminal is a different story. So this is a civil question that we're looking at. And after three months, there must have been, I assume, some form of cancellation. 
because this is the only way that you guys would have gotten a court date. It's the only way that you would have been able to proceed with an eviction. So you would have uh, you know, sent out a letter demanding compliance, failing which we're going to cancel, you would have canceled. At the point of cancellation, anyone staying on the property is actually causing you damages. So it does kind of open up the door uh, for a claim for damages. Uh, so the question here was, but where can I claim from and can I actually sue now the people on the property because they've been staying there? So my argument would be for the first three months, he would be the person. Until you've canceled the lease, your, um, your remedy lies against him. But as soon as you've canceled and anyone staying on the property that you've notified needs to leave remains on the property unlawfully without a lease, at that point, they would also be liable. And if it was up to me, I would issue a summons against all of them, uh, against the, the person that signed the lease for damages, against the people that retained occupation of the property for holding over damages. And yeah, I would basically try and attach assets based on that. Um, and since there are assets on the property now, issuing a summons is not a bad idea. Uh, because he mm -hmm. would have owed you money in terms of the lease agreement. So you could attach, you could send the sheriff there to, to um, uh, put it down in the inventory and you could actually apply pressure using that, uh, that technique. Um, Hans also wants to know, can he apply for a garnish order against the wife? Uh, Solna, I'm not sure if maybe you want to tackle this one. Yes. <laughs> no, so to Bruno's point, uh, if you follow Bruno's advice and that leads to a judgment, um, which it very well could, I think I, I just need to caution here, um, it's not, that's not going to be a quick and easy um, issue summons and get to order because um, I can't see that you're going to be successful there on a summary judgment. So it's, it's probably going to be a longer process. Uh, to prove to, uh, to demonstrate to the court that this is the person that caused you damage, how they caused the damage. But once you have the judgment, all the parties you have the judgment against. So, so I definitely agree with Bruno's advice to issue that summons against the original tenant and the current occupants, um, which will then include the wife. Once you have that judgment, you can follow Section 65 procedure. Um, to get to a garnish order, definitely. But it's not a quick process. <laughs> it's no, it's not. really not. It's, not. it's not. No, thanks, Solna. Thank you, Bruno. Yes. Um, and that, that brings us to the end of this particular session. Uh, I encourage our viewers to go and look at the video that was posted prior to this one, which concerns lockdown level four. And uh, it gives a whole host of information there around how you can operate legally within lockdown level four. Uh, I want to thank again uh, Bruno and Solna for, for joining us and to thank the viewers for staying with us. Uh, I look forward to looking, uh, look forward to seeing you <laughs> all next. Sorry, the spider is making an appearance. I don't relocate. I try to put it near the door and then it, it's a jump, it's a little jumping spider. So it's literally, yeah. <laughs> can we please call, can we please call episode 57A as well as B? The one with Chris and the spider. Can we please? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but thank you, everybody. I'm panicking here slightly, but thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you all next week. <laughs>